Welcome back, you beautiful faces, you beautiful people. Today is December 7th. We are live in the Dallas studio. Um, we've been here a lot recently, as you can tell. Um, before we get going, per usual, please like, please subscribe. It takes two seconds. It really helps me out. Please go follow on the socials if you haven't. Thinking about making a TikTok, probably not a good idea. Um, we'll see how it goes, though. All right, let's get right into it. It should be kind of a short one, I guess. Um, not a whole lot of college football to preview. Um, but yeah, 13, Thunder 13-7. and seven, Took a horrible loss last night to the Houston Rockets by 9, and it felt like we lost by 30. The Houston Rockets are my most hated pro for, pro sports franchise, if I had to pick one. They're just, I, I, they're fans on Twitter, everything about them, their play style, um, their chemistry, like everything about them I hate. Now, Ime Udoka is there to salvage it a little bit because he's a damn good coach, and he has salvaged it uh, from last year to this year. But, yeah, it felt like we lost by 30. One of the most frustrating Thunder games I have can remember watching in my lifetime. Um, two of 14 from three in the first half. And if you're not going to hit any shots, you're not going to win the games. And the Thunder, I mean, I will say, like, we've been lucky. We're, like, the best three-point shooting team in the league, what we were before last night. Um, and that's probably not sustainable with the group we have. Isaiah Joe obviously is going to do his thing, but... Shet shooting over 40% um, would be great, and he definitely can in his career, but I don't think it's this year um, as he's taking a pretty big dip. Shea obviously is going to shoot three a game. He's either going to go one for three or two for three. Um, you know, and then Dort, he's going to hit five one game and then go three games without hitting one. So it's just, I mean, we have super inconsistent people, shooters outside of Giddy. Um, I mean, <laughs> wow. Oh, no, not Giddy, Isaiah Joe. But Shea was probably the only bright spot, 33 points on 13 of 18 shooting with six steals um i saw people saying dylan brooks cuffed him um quite the opposite i mean over his average on 72 percent shooting i wouldn't say is uh cuffing and he did that with the paint being the way it is which we'll talk about in a second i mean i guess trey man had some good minutes he had like 10 points four and four on 50 percent shooting got a chance and shined he made a great play um got two guys in the air and dished it off to i think it was shet for a dunk and made a couple good moves, had a couple buckets. Like, he can definitely carve a rollout if he commits to the defensive end, and he did one time. He got a steal and went down and scored. So if he's going to provide those minutes, he'll definitely be on the floor. Shet, probably his worst game of his professional career. Actually, by far, it's not even close. Uh, four points on two of nine shooting. Just not what we want. Him and Singoon, I was looking forward to the matchup. Obviously, Singoon has been in the league longer. Um, definitely a way better post player, more physical. But Shet didn't even, it didn't even seem like he tried to go at him much. Shet, I mean, the spin move looks good when it works, but when it doesn't and they know it's coming, it doesn't look good. It, I just, I've come to the conclusion when Shet makes a bad play or has a bad turnover, forces a bad shot, it just looks way worse than it actually is. I mean, still a bad shot, but the way he is and the way he moves, his body and frame, it looks really bad. When he loses the ball, it looks really bad. Um, but everyone does it. So just like I said earlier in the season, he's going to have growing pains. This definitely was one of them. Sangoon definitely got the best of them. Sangoon made him look silly a couple times on offense. And now Shaq got him a couple times. He blocked him, forced him his shots, forced a pass. Like it wasn't all Sangoon, but Sangoon definitely had his way for the most part. J-Dub forcing it all game. 5 of 13 and some stupid shots. I mean, going into two people in the lane, taking a pull-up three with no passes on his toes, like not even set. Um, I don't know if he's just feeling the need to assert himself, which we like and I've been asking for, but there's ways to do it, um, and that it was not the way last night. They must have had a game plan. Um, they liked the matchup with J-Dub. I can't even remember who was guarding him because Tari Eason didn't start, so I don't know who would have started on him. Maybe Jabari Smith if they thought he was too big or too slow, but they must have liked the matchup and told him to be aggressive because he certainly was, um, and he didn't play very well. Simple as that. Giddy, 3 for 11. Dort, 0 for 5. All the other starters except for Shea combined for 10 of 38 shooting. Um, if you're doing quick math at home, that's 26%. Can't have that. Isaiah Joe, 1 for 5. At those games are going to happen for him. I mean, he can't shoot 60% from 3 all year. But just when those games do happen... We have to be tenacious on defense and get rebounds um, and get easy buckets, and we didn't do a whole lot of that last night. Cameron Williams and Aaron Wiggins are championship players, guys you want to have on your team to win a championship. But matter of the fact is they aren't. They're shorter than 6'8", so they can't grab rebounds over 6'11", Singoon, or any other really big guy for that matter. Um, 
Now, let's talk about Josh Giddy. Um, we all saw the Rockets put Singoon on him, which is disrespectful in the first place, and then had him playing mega drop coverage. I mean, his heels are on the free throw line when Josh is bringing up the ball. Um, Josh started 2 of 4 from 3. If they're going to let you shoot it, you have to shoot it, make him respect you, but he's just not a good, good enough shooter for that to be a long-term option. So what's the answer? Shea, let me just get this out of the way, ultra impressive that he was as efficient as he was um, with that type of spacing because there's a clip going on on Twitter. It's two minutes and like 15 seconds of every time they did not guard Giddy. Um, and Shea had the ball a couple times with literally a guy in each gap, like nowhere to go, um, and still played great. So, but yeah. So Giddy, for one, he has to attack that guy. I mean, I don't care if it's Singoon. It's tough to attack a guy downhill when they have that much space um, with that much help behind him. But you have to attack him, at least make him take a couple steps back and shoot a floater or work on a mid-range and start taking that. The fact of the matter is, if they're going to play Giddy like that and we're not going to have a good shooting game, I will say he's unplayable. Now, in saying that, this is like the third game someone's done that to us, and that means they are totally... 1 million percent changing their defensive values and how they play defense to bend to how we play offense, which is a compliment to Mark Dagnall um, because they're basically saying our normal defense cannot beat you guys. You guys will run all over us. And that's what we've been doing to teams um, with our driving and cutting and then the few shooters that we do have knocking down shots. Now, teams are going to play giddy like this going forward. Obviously, they will because two straight losses, maybe, maybe three straight losses, I don't know, um, has been played like this. And teams are going to figure it out. This is the blueprint to beat Oklahoma City, especially if we're not knocking down shots. Now, we had so many, so many open threes. Um, I had flashbacks of the Rockets in Game 7 against the Warriors where they missed 27 straight. That's how it felt because there was open threes all over. Dort missed a few. Isaiah Joe missed a few. Shet missed a bunch. Um, just, you got to hit shots. You're in the National Basketball Association. You get paid to hit shots. I don't, I'm not one of, oh, shots just weren't falling tonight. Nope. Yeah, they cannot fall, like, one out of every five games, one out of every ten games. Um, you do have a bad shooting night, but as piss poor as we shot, that can't happen. Uh, maybe that was the one in 20. Um, it certainly looked like it. Um, but it's bad. I know the giddy spacing is bad. It's worse than Killian Hayes with Kate Cunningham and what the Pistons got going on right now. In saying that, though, there still needs to be time. We're 20 games into the regular season. We're second in the West. People need to calm the fuck down. Um, like Jada said on Twitter earlier, people were going at Jada for playing a bad game. He said, look, listen, you're not my parents. One, two, we have 82 games. Three, we're going to figure it out. Four, it happens. We play bad. Five, don't even worry. We're going to be all right. And so hearing them say that's good. Now, I just, I'm just i going to keep saying this till the end of time, until it happens, because I just fear that it's going to happen so bad. J-Dub one day saying, I can go average 25 on my own team and wanting to go do that and make more money probably. Hopefully it never comes to that, um, but it could. But as far as Giddy goes, yes, Mark Dagonal has a decision to make, especially if teams keep playing him like this and he doesn't play well. Especially, if, I mean, he's shooting 3 of 11 and doesn't even have anyone guarding him um, outside of the paint. That can't happen. Like, you got to develop a mid-range, um, shoot a longer floater, spend hours and hours and hours shooting threes with Chip England. Like, I don't know what we're doing with that. It doesn't look good, though. It's not fun to watch. Um, I, f I feel like it literally, I was watching that video today, and it felt like Ben Simmons. And my buddies have been saying, oh, he's just Ben Simmons. And I'm like, no, he's not. He's a little bit better. Um, but he might be. And I'm not on the giddy, like, I was going to say fire, but trade giddy train or cut your giddy train yet. Um, obviously pending investigation, but it, we're not that far. It's just, it's not that bad. The teams have done it for three games, and yeah, it's worked for them, and guess what? We got one of the best damn coaches and best GMs in the NBA. They're going to figure out a way to counter it, I promise you. Have Giddy go be a screener, um, go screen Giddy's man, have a short roll with Shet. Like, that would be an easy fix. Um, run Spain action with Giddy as the screener. It's not that complicated. Like, I'm, I mean, I promise they're thinking of these things. And the people tweeting on Twitter, um, trying to be NBA GM, GMs, I know a hell of a lot about basketball, and I'll put my basketball IQ and knowledge up against anyone's, um, especially on Twitter. You guys got to calm down. I mean, yeah, we can all see that it looks bad. And guess what? If we can see it, they can see it. And if they can see it, they're trying to fix it. And that's what they're going to do. Um, like I said, Mark's going to experiment with different lineups. He gave Trey Mann minutes last night. He said he felt like he earned them um, and gave it to him, and he performed well. So he'll probably keep getting those minutes until he doesn't. Anyway, 
just calm down on Giddy. I know it's not good. I watch it too. It doesn't look good. It's not fun to watch. Definitely hurting our chances to win. But it's not life or death right now at all. Um, Warriors on Friday. I'm worried. They didn't play great against the uh, Blazers last night. Squeaked out a win. All None of them really shot well. I'm worried. I don't want to drop like three or four in a row and go back to 13 and 8. We need to get a couple wins in a row. But the Rockets, you got to give them credit. They shot the three well as much as I hate them. They shot the three well, which they're not going to do that again if we play. So there's one. Two, Ime Yudoka is a hell of a coach. They are now 9 and 1 at home, and their record is 9 and 9. So, quick math again. That's 0 and 9 away from um, Houston. It's not good, obviously. All right. Water of choice tonight. Great value, hydrate alkaline water. pH is 9.5. Hmm. I finally decided I'm going to be in a hotel this long. I might as well buy a pack of waters. These are the cheapest one at Walmart. Bigger bottles so I can have it throughout the day at work. Um, but yeah. Are we going to give credit to the Rockets on defense? We'll give credit to Ime Udoka for the game plan against Giddy, which he saw from Minnesota um, and the other recent games we've played. But we just missed open shots. Like I said, if we play that game ten times, we don't shoot as bad as we did, especially in the first half again. So I'm not worried about it. Um, I did place a responsibly large wager, wager I tweeted on the Thunder last night. Probably the biggest NBA bet I've ever placed. And let's be clear, I don't bet a lot of money. Um, so you can guess how much that is. But responsibly large wager. And I said this is probably me with my blinders on with my Rockets hatred and there's no way we lose this game because the Rockets suck which they will do by the end of the year. And if they get in the playoffs, Alperin Singoon will not be able to play in the playoffs. I commented on a bit under a big Houston um, Twitter account saying you, you're going to love him until he can't play in the playoffs. And everyone's coming at my head saying, oh, you're just mad about the trade you made and got giddy instead of him. No, I'm not mad. Um, I didn't even remember that that was part of a trade at all. I don't want Alperin Singoon. We've had he just can't I promise you. They are similar players. Alperin Singoon, much better, can pass better, probably a little bit more athletic. But they're the exact same type of players. Um, and those type of players, you know, Singoon won't be 100% unplayable because he's their leading scorer and he's going to have to be on the floor. But we saw Enos Kanter in a playoff series against Steph Curry, against like a John Morant now. Like, he's getting blown by, turned around, um, falling down. Like, it's not going to be able to work and it's not going to be pretty because you know what happens in the NBA playoffs? People hunt matchups. And people are going to do that exact same thing to Alperin Singoon and the Houston Rockets if they make the playoffs. Just a matter of the fact, guys. I don't know what to tell you. It's, he's going to be unplayable in the playoffs. He's going to give you 20, and he'll give up 30 on him. So if it's worth it to have him out there, Houston, and you're so happy you took him, you know, have at it. I mean, he's going to put up stats in the regular season. He's going to help you get wins. And I guess that's what you need as a Houston team right now that has been worse than the Thunder the past few years. So... If you want to take that as your as your win for the season, um, because you're going to go 500 instead of 15 wins, fine. But when you get in the playoffs with him and expect him to be your one option, he's going to get torched. Just a matter of the fact. I don't make the rules. I watch the games. That's all I do. Timberwolves beat the Spurs. Who the Spurs have now lost 15 games in a row. Has anyone else lost that many in a row? Oh, I think the Detroit Pistons. I think those two should play each other. Whichever one loses should be forced to be one of the teams that relocates in the expansion. I guess relocate and expansion don't mix, but you, know, you get the point. Wimby, he's putting up numbers, almost 20 and 10, like I said, but still shooting terrible. 40% from the field, 27% from three. Not good. I mean, they're just going to throw this year in the trash, I guess, let Wimby get acclimated to the NBA. Timberwolves are now 16 and 4 and the number one team in the Western Conference, which is crazy to say. And crazy to say that it's at 16 and 4 with a multiple three or four game lead ahead of us. And it starts with Rudy Gobert. As much as I say it, I'm not a huge fan of him, but it starts with Rudy Gobert. Um, he's back to the Defensive Player of the Year form that he is. Certainly is probably the front runner of Defensive Player of the Year if, if we voted right now. We gave him his fourth, which I believe is tied or the most ever. Um, and yeah, he's back to. He's motivated. He's bouncing around. He didn't look good with France this summer, but he sure as hell looks good right now in Minnesota. This was kind of the dream they had, um, bringing in Cat next to Gobert, is letting Cat um, attack smaller fours, especially off the dribble, backing them down, um, or being that top-of-the-key shooter with Rudy inside. Now, it doesn't look pretty when it doesn't work, um, like we've seen the past couple years with the spacing 
and both of their personalities. But all of a sudden, you dazzle in a developed Anthony Edwards who is probably the best best fourth quarter scorer in the NBA right now. I mean, I think he had 17 in the fourth last night. That man can go get you 15 to 20 in the fourth quarter, you know, every other game. That's someone you need on your team to win. That type of defense is what you need on your team to win. Um, so I'm high on the Timberwolves. I think they could not only win but make a run. I mean, the Denver Nuggets said that was their toughest series last year. So I'm very high on them. I think they could, you know, if they earn the number one spot, it's not going to be like Atlanta Hawks or Memphis Grizzlies the other year where they get bounced in the first round. I truly believe, I mean, yeah, if they play the Lakers or the Warriors in the first round, it's going to be tough, Suns. But I think they're going to make noise, and I like what they're doing. I mean, you have Naz Reed coming off the bench, backing up the Twin Towers, shooting or averaging 13 points and shooting 50, 40, 90, like as a center. You know how crazy that is? Naz Reed was kind of a lost thought for a little bit, but he's developed there in Minnesota. Chris Finch, um, their coach, is one of the best offensive minds in the league. And that was their problem was offense. So he's got them rolling. They're figuring stuff out. The offense still could be a problem down the stretch, but if they're going to hold teams to 105 points, they're going to win most games, especially if it's close in the fourth quarter with that defense and with Anthony Edwards. And Mike Conley, who I haven't even mentioned, shooting an insane clip from three, having his quietly one of his best seasons ever. I think he's, like, tied for the second oldest in the league um, or maybe third behind P.J. Tucker. But he's in, like, year 17 or 18, still – a bona fide starting point guard. Jaden McDaniels, obviously a 3 and D guy on the wing. They got they have pieces. I mean, they've impressed me. Chris French has impressed me, their coach, figuring it out. On defense, we're going to add a use cat. I mean, we've seen a cat and go bear pick and roll that led to a lob, which is very fun to watch. And quite frankly, when you have Anthony Edwards, uh, fixes a lot of things. Uh, play in semifinals tonight. We have Pacers Bucks, absolute track meet. If you like points, tune in. It's actually. Uh, about to start starts at four that is in 15 minutes which hopefully i get out of here to make a bet um pacers one of the stories of the season so far halliburton definitely is um absolutely torched didn't torch boston let me rephrase that um had a great win over boston the first round of the playing tournament and we saw what adam silver's envision was for the playing tournament i mean i don't know what their arena is called in indianapolis but it was rocking we saw I mean, Halliburton hit an and one three at one point. Buddy Heald hit a dagger three. They had a dunk where, you know, the whole bench runs out on the court. Everyone's going crazy. And we haven't ever got that before in late November, early December in the NBA. Um, and credit to Adam Silver and the rest of the guys in the office. They figured out a way to do it because, quite frankly, in the NBA, no one watches till after football. Everyone watches the Christmas Christmas Day games. They watch around the trade deadline and all-star break. Um, and then they kind of tune out to the playoffs. This is kind of what they need to bring that playoff feel into the regular season. As many games in the regular season as they can get to matter, which in my mind they do that by cutting the games down to like 70. But as many games as they can get to matter matters, and they are doing that right now with the play-in, play-in season tournament. NBA Cup, as some are calling. I personally love that name. The NBA Cup sounds awesome to me. Um, but, yeah, Pacers are fun to watch. Like I said, track me. Halliburton is insane. He doesn't turn the ball over, and he averages like 10 assists a game with putting up 28 and shooting over 40% from three. I don't know how he does it because the shot's terrible and it takes so long to release, but he gets it up there and he gets it done. Um, the Bucks, probably the second best offense in the NBA. Damian Lillard said today, we're 15-6, and six, and I don't even feel like we've gotten going yet. And you could look at him and say that might be true because Chris Middleton's averaging like 20 minutes a game, just coming back from injury. He doesn't look like himself. He's had one great game. Um, and Damian Yonis are still less than 20 games in. And Damian Lillard's been insane in the clutch. Other than that, he hasn't had one of his best seasons ever. Um, but in the clutch, he is balling. I mean, he's hit a couple game winners. I think he has like 70 points in the clutch this year, which is like by far number one. Giannis is Giannis, obviously. Um... They need Pat Connaughton to give them more. Some of the bench guys, Jay Crowder's not playing, obviously. They're going to need a bigger wing that can defend and hit threes down the stretch, especially if Middleton can't return to form. But I love what they're doing. Um, I think they're tied with first and east with the Celtics. Um, but I'll take the Bucks tonight. Um, I think Giannis will be locked in. Dame will be locked in. Um, kind of that Vegas. It just feels kind of like a uh, bubble-type game. I saw the court earlier, and I think Dame's going to flourish. Um and the Pacers, they don't play defense at all. Like, I'm taking the Bucks to play more defense than the Pacers. Obviously, Brooke Lopez on the back end, Giannis. Um, the Bucks need to trade for Marcus Smart. That just came to my head. 
Um, if he's going to be wasted down there in Memphis, especially when Jaw gets back, like imagine Marcus Smart and Dame in the backcourt with Giannis and Brooke Lopez. You have Marcus Smart and Brooke Lopez, guard the best big, guard the best guard. Dame and Giannis, two of the best players in the world um, that can go get you buckets. And Marcus Smart can be serviceable as a knockdown shooter. I mean, he'll shoot 36%, which there's worse out there. Pat Conson right now is shooting 34 I mean, if you have him on the floor to be a three-point sniper, he hasn't been that. Uh, but, yeah, I'll take the Bucks to win, and I will take them to meet the Pelicans. That's right. Game two, we have Lakers-Pelicans tonight. Um, I'm taking the Pelicans. I just think it's one of those things. It's it's they're meshed right now. They're playing well together. They just got all everyone back healthy. That's their main thing. If you look at their roster and talent, um, let's start with their big three: Zion, Brandon Ingram, um, and CJ McCollum. There's questions there, but the the supporting pieces are what I love the most: Herb Jones, Jose Alvarado, Trey Murphy just came back. He's a hell of a player. He could end up being like their third option. Um, he I think he's that good. Just guys you went to win. Jonas Valanciunas, obviously solid. Um, they're a damn good team if they can be. I think it's up to Willie Green. He started to show a little bit. He did a phenom- phenomenal job coaching against the Kings and making adjustments in that game. And the first round of the play-in, and if he can continue to do that, I'm high on the Pelicans. It's kind of like the Timberwolves, Thunder, and Pelicans. I guess you could throw Kings in there, but they made the playoffs last year. Um, I guess Timberwolves did too, and Pelicans are in the plan. But those young type of teams that have so much talent um, really are going to lead the West for the next few years, and I'm excited for it. But their big three, C.J. McCollum, Brandon Ingram, and Zion, obviously Zion only had 10 points the other night, took like five five or six shots. Um, They're going to have to figure out who's number one because I think it's uh, worse than the honest situation. Zion's not creating his own shot. I mean, he can if he gets it at the high post, jab, go. But people are going to start keying on that. You can only run that action once or twice a game before it gets too repetitive. So he's like a great player, obviously. But it's like who's C.J. McCollum? We know what he's going to do. He's going to go up there put up his numbers. He can go get 20 every night, but he's not a good defender. Brandon Ingram is wishy-washy, it seems like, recently. I mean, he's shown he could average 28. But it's like, where is he going to get the shots to do it? Is he going to get the chances to do it? Especially when you have like guys like Herb Jones shooting well from three now, which I don't think are last, but it's still impressive. Um, Trey Murphy is back and is damn good. Um, Jose Alvarado can shoot. Like They're kind of in the Thunder situation. They have so much talent. Um, and I feel like the Thunder figured out a little bit more. The hierarchy, obviously having Shea helps. They don't have a bona fide superstar. But I'm high on the Pelicans, and I just think it's – this is one of those games where, like, if you gave me a gun to my head for one game life, you know, if the Martians have the beam pointed at planet Earth, I'm taking LeBron and the Lakers. But tonight, I'm going to take the Pelicans. I just I think it'll be a great game. But imagine if LeBron adds an NBA Cup to his legacy. I'm going to be unfathomable. You won't be able to bear me. That will give him GOAT status. He already has it, by the way. But that will push him so far above Michael Jordan he won't ever be caught by anyone. An NBA Cup, the first ever NBA Cup, are we going to sit here and say that the man that wins the first ever NBA Cup isn't going to make him the best of all time, even if you're a Jordan guy? NBA Cup matters, as we've seen. And giving that, to LeBron having that on his resume, untouchable. Untouchable. Not the finals, not the records. It's the NBA Cup that will separate him from Michael Jordan. Mark my words. If they win, which I don't think they will. They've been playing a little bit better. I think they're sitting at 13-9. and nine. Austin Reeves, a lot of it comes down to him because he has to be the third option on that team. And he's been inconsistent this year. He had a big shot in the playing game against the Suns. Put him up four under a minute left. But he's just got to be better. LeBron averaging like 28-7, or sorry, 25-8-7, I think, if you round up this year. And year 21, pretty insane, shooting over 50%. Anthony Davis, we know, is super wishy-washy. And if he locks in and plays well, they're a very hard team to beat, especially if he locks in on the defensive end. Um, but I'll take the Pelicans to have a Bucks pelicans NBA in-season tournament championship, and I will take the Pelicans. Hell with it. I think it would be awesome to see a young team like that win the NBA first NBA Cup, um, and I think it, they are really, really care about it. I saw a video of Willie Green in the locker room you know, saying, every game we play matters, but these are fun. You're the first team in NBA history that has a chance to win this thing, so embrace it, um, and I think they're going to do just that. And not to mention, we all saw the video of Brandon Ingram and Zion in the press conference saying, giving themselves a little laugh and a little hint of what 
they expect if they win the tournament, those two in Vegas. We know Zion in Vegas, and I assume Brandon Ingram gets down as well. So before we get to college football, let me take a sip from our alkaline water and go to golf, which I don't know if I've mentioned yet on this show. Um, John Rahm to the live for reportedly 500 to $600 million now. You can't blame him. Simple as that. I'd probably do the same thing. I mean, you set your kids, 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 kids up for life. Why not take it? I mean, you put that, give it to one of the best financial advisors in the world for firms in the world. That thing's doubled within 10 years. Like, stupid. Um, but I love John Rom. But I can't sit here and act like he's not a man, not, not going back on his word because he said, I don't need the money. Um, blah, 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 this, this, and this, that. I'm not going to go. And here he is going later. Um, I don't know why he wouldn't have just went in the first place for $600 million, personally. But this sucks for the PGA. It does. This was like a – not a knockout blow at all, but this is like your your Masters winner, your front page guy, him and Scotty Scheffler, and I guess Victor Hovland right now, taking over the sport – and he just gets poached, gets poached right before, right when they're in the merger negotiations too. So this just takes away so much stuff from the PGA having in their back pocket to pull out um, in negotiations with Liv. I thought that merger was going to happen for this upcoming season. I guess maybe not. And also if you're Liv, I know they have money to burn, but like how are you going to give a guy $600 million? And I think they're four-year contracts or three-year contracts. Those are like play for this much and you'll get this much. And – and you're planning on merging within the next two years. Like, are you, you going to get them the $600 million before then just to go, just so you can merge? Doesn't really seem like all that, I don't know, advantageous for Liv. Um, definitely helps them if they just want to stick it to the PGA Tour, obviously. Um, but, yeah, sadly, in golf, we're heading towards four tournaments that are going to matter, and those are the majors. No one cares about the Liv tournaments. The guys don't even care. They're just getting paid so much money, and they get to wear shorts they play. Um, it's kind of fun, but viewership was not very good for Liv last year on the CW. And quite frankly, the PGA Tour is going to go down too, and you don't have guys like John Rahm, Brooks Kepka, Dustin Johnson in these events. So for the casual golf fan, not the casual golf fan, I'm not a casual golf fan, for the really, really hardcore golf fan that will watch pretty much every tournament on TV, especially after football season, it sucks because there's these events that don't have these guys in them. Not a lot of them are going to play, especially when you have the PGA Tour having their designated 12 events um, that are higher purses. Like, what's making guys only play in those, which would suck for guys to play 12 times a year on the PGA Tour like they do on Live. Just battle around. I just want them to merge. I want it to go back to normal, get more money in, maybe combine. I know this is Saudi's plan all along is to infiltrate, like, American sports, and they started with golf. Um, because golf was obviously the easiest to do it because the players were unhappy with the money percentage they were getting. started with Phil Mickelson. But it's like, just merge. Let's have the best players in the world play against each other. Please, God. The Ryder Cup was so refreshing this year. There was no live, PJ Tour. And I think Brooks was the only live guy on the team. And, like, yeah, Brooks is a, um, an asshole, but, like, those guys on the team, they don't mind him. They don't hate him because he went to live, at least. If they don't like him, it's because of his personal... Um, character and not because he went to live, I promise you. All right, college football real quick. Not much going on. Army-Navy this weekend. I'm not going to say a peep about it. I don't know anything about these two teams. Now when it comes down to it, I'll probably do a smidge of research and bet on it, but I probably won't watch a ton of it, um, especially if it's not a good game. But it's to make a bowl game. They're both 5-6, and six, which I have questions. How does one make a bowl game when the bowl games are already set? Now I'm going to look like a real idiot when there's a team waiting to play one whoever wins this game. But it's like, what... What if all the bowl games are filled? I hope not, but, like, are they going to – they could turn around and play each other again to see who wins the bowl, I guess. But it, just frustrating. Heisman finalists, Jaden Daniels, Michael Penix, Bo Nix, and Marvin Harrison Jr. I think my pick would have to be Jaden Daniels when you see the numbers he puts up, basically 5,000 5, total yards, um, I think, like, 40 or 50 touchdowns total. Um, he's played running back also for the LSU team while putting up almost the same passing numbers as Bo Nix and Michael Penix. However – if you take out Jaden Daniels, um, I'm voting for Michael Penix. Leads the league in passing yards. Um, his team's 13 and 0. They won the Pac-12 championship. Beat Bo Nix twice. You got to. I mean, Michael Penix is a dog. I love watching him throw the football. I love watching him play. That Texas game is going to be insane. But he would be second. I guess Bo Nix would be third, just because 
Um, I don't want to vote for Marvin Harrison Jr., but you can't vote the Heisman guy for Heisman. He had 65% of his yards come after the catch. Sorry, not going to happen. And we get to Marvin Harrison Jr. Why is Marvin Harrison Jr. in New York? He's got like the sixth or seventh best receiving stats this year, and I know he had trouble at quarterback. Kyle McCord wasn't the best. Um, that offense wasn't great, but you can't. If if a wide receiver is ever going to win the Heisman, he has to blow the stats category out of the water, and he simply did not do that. He didn't even do that. He's not even first in the wide receivers. Yeah, we know he's talented, but the Heisman is not a popularity contest. It's the best player in the nation. Um, if we're going to give Marvin Harrison Jr. the Heisman, which he's not going to win it, but Blackman had a better year twice by numbers, like lapped him almost. James Washington had a better year. Tylen Wallace had a better year. There's guys, Devontae Smith, obviously won the Heisman, who I didn't think deserved to win the Heisman, um, had a better year. The guy from Malik Neighbors from LSU had a way better year, but I understand they're not going to put two guys in from LSU. I just don't like Marvin Harrison even getting to be there. Like, let him go on. Let him go to the draft. He's not going to win the Heisman. He said all he wanted to do was beat Michigan. He would trade all the money and everything for that, at least next year, to beat Michigan. But he should not be in New York. I don't know what to tell you. Like, I would be okay more with Ollie Gordon being in New York. At This is an unbiased take than Marvin Harrison Jr. And I still don't even think Ollie deserves to be in New York. Simple as that. Um, speaking of Ollie Gordon, he's an All-American. Um... Leads the nation, I think. He did before the last week in rushing yards. I know he only had like 40, though, in the Big 12 championship. Nonetheless, leads the Big 12 in rushing yards and rushing touchdowns. Um, All-American. Looks like it's going to be a unanimous unanimous All-American. If he doesn't win the Doak Walker Award, there's problems. Chuba didn't win it in 2019 when he had an outstanding season and kind of did the same thing. Led the nation in rushing and touchdowns. If all he doesn't win it, it'll be a shame because... Quite simply, the man is talented, um, and I hope people want to come block for him next year so we have an offensive line. He was voted J- – Jaden Daniels, I forgot to mention, won AP Player of the Year today. Um, that normally coincides um, and is proportional with the Heisman. Ollie was voted fifth, though, which surprises me. I don't know if Ollie was fifth in the Heisman voting, um, which would have been pretty cool if Ollie got to go to New York. But I didn't think that was ever in the cars. Nick Martin, middle linebacker for Oklahoma State, led the Big 12 in tackles with 133. Second was at 101, so there's quick math for you, 32 above second place. Brendan Presley led the Big 12 in receptions, so good to see some guys getting recognition, stat leaders. Um, Nick Nicholas Martin is a beast, and I don't know what year he is, but I hope he comes back. I assume he is. I heard Ollie was coming back, nothing official. He hasn't tweeted or anything, but I heard we forked up some money for him, which is good because I heard Texas gave him a big offer. I mean, everyone's going to get Georgia's probably going to give him a huge offer. They're going to need a running back. Um down south a little bit OU Danny Stutzman is heading to the draft and not coming back which I don't like if I was his manager or agent whatever I guess if you're his agent you want him to go and make money but he is like the perfect college um, marketable athlete and he's douchey he's funny he doesn't care what people think of him he'll dye his hair he'll make videos like he seems to fit the perfect college mold right now for what companies and brands would want to partner with and pay him and people at OU loved him. I mean, he's a damn good football player. Personally, I don't like him. Uh, he's a cocky SOB, which is fine, whatever a lot of those guys are. But he's a damn good football player, and that's probably why he's going to the draft. But I don't really – I'm not going to sit here and act like I know how to read linebackers and their projections in the NFL, but he doesn't seem big enough. Uh, yeah, he can stick his nose in, um, and I guess he can maybe make up that with that for speed. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm going to stop talking before I sound like an idiot. But I just don't know why he would go. It seems like one of those guys that would soak up everything he could get in college, probably go win you know, the linebacker award next year or whatever it is, be the best linebacker in college football, um, and then go try and get drafted and have a five-year career in the NFL as a backup, get your pension, and move along. Like, I don't know. But, hey, props to him if he makes it. Um, the Cotton Bowl has been extended, or I guess the Red River rivalry has been extended to keep being played in the Cotton Bowl on the state fairgrounds through 2036. Um, with an $140 million renovation, which is the most money they've ever put in a renovation there. And they play one game a year there. I don't know if they play high school football or anything there, but they're doing all this, $140 million to keep playing one game. One game there. Um, doesn't seem worth it to me, but I'm glad it's staying there because this was my first experience this past year there. 
the, the fair, the environment, the old stadium, it all makes it, and it's awesome. It definitely would not be the same in Jerry's world whatsoever. Um, I am a fan of keeping the Cotton Bowl at the State Fair, or the Red River Rivalry at the State Fair and the Cotton Bowl for as long as possible until that thing starts crumbling down. I'd put it the second, my second biggest favorite rivalry in college football behind Ohio State, Michigan. Um, transfer portal is blowing up. There's a ton of A&M guys in there, um, a lot of Ohio State guys in there, decent amount of OU guys in there, but not a lot of people I think are going to hurt them. Um, yeah, Dylan Gabriel's in the portal. He visited Oregon today. I have it on good authority that he will be an Oregon Duck. Um, now, I also have it on good authority that he is visiting Ohio State and probably Florida State, and I know Florida State's going to fork over money, and I know Ohio State needs a quarterback next year. Um, but I think right when he transferred, his thought was Oregon, and I think he told them that and basically verbally committed. Um, one, they're close to Hawaii. He's from Hawaii, obviously. They play there next year. He's going to get a decent amount of money from Nike, the Nike money, and they're going to have a chance to win. They're going to be good next year too. Um, but obviously if you go to Ohio State, Florida State, you're going to be good as well. Um, Kyle McCord is in the portal. Who knows where he goes? Probably Illinois or Indiana. Um, Dante Moore, former five-star for Michigan, who was at UCLA this past year. Um, I think his final three was Oregon, Michigan, UCLA. He picked UCLA, so – I would look out, especially if Dylan Gabriel goes to Oregon. He's probably lined up at Michigan to be after McCarthy, I would imagine. Um, Cam Ward, who's rated as the number one quarterback in the portal from Washington State. Gunslinger, doesn't make a ton of mistakes. He, I know the season went downhill for Washington State towards the end of the year, but at the start of the year he was balling. Um, he had like – he was like leading the nation in passing yards and touchdowns without an interception through like four games. Um, teams are going to line up and back up the Brinks truck for him. Um, Will Howard from Kansas State, obviously in the portal. Kind of surprising. I think Avery Johnson, their backup, is too. Um, I don't know. I just saw K-State imploding. Colin Klein left to go to A&M. Um, Riley Leonard's in the portal from Duke. You have to think it's a Notre Dame or a Texas A&M. He's either going to follow Elko to Texas A&M or go replace Sam Hartman um, at Notre Dame is what I've heard. And DJ Hughes in the portal, which has had connection to Florida State, obviously probably Michigan State because of Jonathan Smith, his coach at Oregon State, going there now. So it'll be interesting. Um, it's open season right now in the portal. Obviously there's tons of linemen and linebackers and corners and receivers that are in there um, that I don't know the names of, and we'll see where they shake out when it's all said and done. Thursday night football tonight. This is longer than I thought. Sorry, guys. I'm going to skip Mahogany and McDonald's. I've been doing decent in NCAA basketball, but I haven't been watching as much as I liked. And the NBA, I thought I had figured out the last two nights have been rough, so I'm not going to give out any picks this weekend. But there's that football. Patriots at Steelers. I mean, I would like to shred this up into 100 pieces and shoot it into my eyeballs rather than watch that game. I mean, that's what that game is going to be like to watch it. I'm personally not going to watch it. I'll keep up with it, but I am not watching it, um, just so we're clear. Steelers are favored by five and a half. Mitchell Trubisky, last chance you, coming in with the Steelers tonight starting against, I think, Bailey Zappi starting for New England. I don't know. They suck. Jets suck. Steelers suck. How are the Steelers 7-5? I mean, Mike Tomlin, hell of a job, like always. I don't have a clue what's going to happen in this game, but when you watch this, Evidently, it'll be Steelers 16 to 10, which would imply that I'll take Steelers to cover and the under by the hook on both. Um, I might take the Steelers, but I just think it could be one of those trap games where, you know, I guess Mike Mike Tomlin at home on prime time. He he's a winner, but I think that's as an underdog. So I'm probably just gonna stay away from it because then I'll have to watch it, and I don't want to watch it simply. Um, but yeah, Steelers 16 to 10 by the time you watch this, and you know what comes next. That's all I got. Um, if you haven't, please go like. Please subscribe. Um, helps me out a lot. Um, but, yeah, have a good weekend. Be a good person. And we will talk on Monday.